This is an AML on the go presentation. I'm Mark Levis. I direct the leukemia program at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm going to be talking about a recent publication in the Lancet Oncology titled Selective Inhibition of FLT3 by Giltaritinib in Relapsed or Refractory Acute Myeloid Leukemia, a multicenter, first in human, open label phase one, two study. First, a bit of background, FLT3 and AML. Anybody who takes care of AML patients knows about FLT3. This, uh, this is a receptor tyrosine kinase expressed on the blasts in most cases of AML. And activating mutations of this receptor tyrosine kinase occur in a significant fraction of patients. The most common one are the internal tandem duplication mutations, and less commonly are the so-called tyrosine kinase domain mutations. These uh, internal tandem duplication mutations, the so-called ITD mutations, confer the worst prognosis. For many years, groups around the world have been trying to develop FLT3 tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and there are a number of them that are in development, uh, including mitostorin, serafinib, quasartinib, crinolinib, giltaritinib, and actually quite a number of others. I'm listing, I'm going to talk mainly about the most dominant ones uh, right now, but there are a number uh, in development, even more than I've listed here. Mitostorin is a multi-targeted inhibitor that is active against FLT3 in vitro, but it's not terribly effective as monotherapy for these patients. It is approved for the treatment of newly diagnosed FLT3 mutated AML, but it's only given with chemotherapy. And again, I want to emphasize it's ineffective as a single agent, simply because it lacks potency in vivo. So for some years, people have been looking for more selective potent FLT3 inhibitors, and agents such as quizartinib or serafinib, which is approved for liver and kidney cancer, but in fact is a FLT3 inhibitor, can induce some responses as monotherapy, but resistance emerges quickly in the form of FLT3 tyrosine kinase domain mutations. Giltaritinib, which is shown up in the upper right here, uh, was developed specifically to target both types of mutations and to be potent and selective. And shown in the table below uh, is its activity in vitro against the various forms of FLT3. So this trial uh, was looking at relapsed refractory AML patients, and obviously there was an emphasis on patients with FLT3 mutations, but we did want to know whether the drug had any activity in patients lacking these mutations. It was a typical population for a trial like this. These patients were heavily pretreated. A, a number of them had relapsed after stem cell transplant, and a number of them had been exposed to prior FLT3 inhibitors. The design, though, is a bit unique. So this is called the Chrysalis trial, and as you can see from this escalating dose scale in this diagram here, we started at 20 milligrams and went all the way on up to 450 milligrams. Each dose level was actually expanded, and we looked at both response rates as well as FLT3 inhibition as assessed by an ex vivo assay, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we were really focusing on inhibiting the target, not just safety and tolerability here, to get a, a, our best dose. And the blue box outlines the two dose levels that we expanded further and put on a, quite a number of patients that actually had FLT3 mutations, so we could really do a phase two portion of this study. Now, shown here are two figures that illustrate the in vivo FLT3 inhibition achieved by this drug. And so in the figure on the left uh, with the red dots here, 20 milligrams had a scattering of FLT3 inhibition. So you can see what you want to do to get a response in this disease is thoroughly turn off FLT3, or rather phosphorylated FLT3, which is the marker of activation of FLT3. And you can see that as we marched up dose levels, the phosphorylation of FLT3 was suppressed. Uh, and finally, when you got up to two and 300 milligrams, it was suppressed in virtually all patients. Now shown on the right are the actual Western blots, uh, and th these are typical Western blots from patients on these dose levels. So you can see marching up 20, 40, 80, 120, 200, and 300 milligrams, you really blank out FLT3's activity starting at 120 milligrams. 80 was pretty good, uh, but 120 seemed to be the earliest point at which there was really complete suppression of FLT3 activity. 
patients tolerated this drug quite well. Uh, the adverse events, while typical ones associated with this population, were actually fairly minimal. And we actually did not reach a DLT until we got up to 450 milligrams. So even though, as I've just said, 120 milligrams was the effective FLT3 inhibitory dose, we were able to go up much higher than that. Interestingly, the clinical activity correlated very precisely with the FLT3 inhibition that we saw. I mentioned that we saw good inhibition at doses above 80 milligrams, or 80 milligrams and above, but our best inhibition actually occurred starting at 120 milligrams, and this was the group that gave us the highest composite complete response rate, shown here on that uh, graph in the upper right. Survival for these patients actually also correlated with uh, the efficacy of FLT3 inhibition as patients who were treated with FLT3 inhibitory doses of this drug had better survival than those not. To summarize, giltritinib was well tolerated across a wide range of doses and displayed a long half-life that was supportive of once daily administration. As a single agent, the drug demonstrated strong anti-leukemic activity in this heavily pretreated FLT3 mutant population. Doses of 80 milligrams and higher were associated with more potent target inhibition, higher response rates, and longer survival. And the response rates were actually similar in patients harboring both types of mutations and in patients with FLT3 IgD mutations alone. There was minimal activity in FLT3 wild type and distinctly less activity in patients who had only the D835 mutation. That ends this talk.